<laughs> All right. Today with us we have uh, Jaden Irving from uh, Ninja Warrior. So uh, introduce yourself there. G'day guys, I am Jaden Irving from Ninja Warrior. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you've done a stellar sort of start there. That's, that's basically me. I'm sure there's a few other little bits and pieces that people have seen me amongst, but uh, but yeah, it's, that's it for the start. <laughs> So that's so, how that's uh, Go on, Jaden. Go on. So, Jaden, how did you get involved with Ninja Warrior then? Uh, well, the short and long of it is um, since being a kid, uh, I've always been a fan of movies and all that sort of stuff. Um, Love more gravitated towards the action side of stuff. And that through life has led me towards snowboarding, skateboarding, um, basically trying any other sports outside of your general football, soccer, and tennis and all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, through that, I've never really mastered one particular sport over my entire life um, because I've got like a bit of an ADHD brain. So uh, I've constantly been trying this and trying that and I've never been victorious at one particular area. So um, I suppose when, uh, you know, Sasuke first came out um, in Japan and, and then all the subsequent Ninja Warriors, I thought, oh, wow, this is kind of a really incredible amalgamation of all the different sports and things that I've played with over my life. And, um, Again, you know, still haven't dominated that one yet, but uh, but I feel like out of all my sports and different skills combined, that's kind of channeled me into um, being fairly fairly good at swinging on stuff and um, pretending to be a ninja, I guess. Yeah. And like it does, it does not look easy to do those courses. <laughs> oh my god, uh, we were watching some of your uh, some of your runs there, and oh my god, that you had a lot of control. <laughs> Yeah, I think everyone's got a different style uh, when it comes to doing Ninja Warrior and I think out of control is kind of a good way to phrase the way that I hit the course. Um, some people look so poised and perfect and precise. Um, i got to admit I'm a little bit of a hack. My skill, oh no, I should say my, um, uh, my technique on, on the Ninja Warrior course doesn't look fantastic but the way I figure it, as long as you get through the course and you get it done, that's where it's at. So out of, out of control is a good way to phrase it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh you did it twice didn't you 27th and 2018 yeah so i uh, competed season one and season two and um season three i actually didn't compete for a couple of reasons there was a uh, a stunt uh film that i was working on so i work as a stunt man uh professionally um and so there was a film i was working on that kind of conflicted with the dates um plus also i'd done myself a bit of a um, a mischief with the Ninja Warrior crew because I, uh, I also got picked up to uh, appear on Ultimate Beastmaster, which is a, a Netflix show. Um, so those who aren't in Australia or can't view online um, the Australian Ninja Warrior runs, Ultimate Beastmaster is, yeah, just a, a Netflix version of the show. Um, in my opinion, it was actually even more fun to run. Um, and, yeah, so I competed on season three. And the difference is mainly being that it's an international competition. So Australia versus Mexico, USA, Brazil, UK. Um, and it's kind of they choose the six top competitors from each country and they all battle each other, um, fastest runs and that sort of stuff, uh, kind of a knockout competition um, until the grand final. And uh, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't watched it yet, but um, I, I did quite well on that. So that was... That was kind of the reason why I didn't run season three of Ninja Warriors because I was um, a part of that and, you know, Ultimate Beastmaster. It was one That's kind of cool, to be honest. Ninja Warriors separate and they were kind of like, oh, I don't know if we want you to do them both. So, yeah. <laughs> Would you ever return back to Ninja Warrior, though, if you ever had the opportunity? Um. So I think I, I would. I feel like I've got the ability to potentially win. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to you know, throw it out there. I have the ability to win. That's the way everyone likes to hear it. Um, but uh, funnily enough, um, for season four, uh, which uh, in Australia, we actually just recently finished shooting season four of Australian Ninja Warrior. Um, I actually worked as a tester um, and a demonstrator because I got contacted after Ultimate Beastmaster by the actual, uh, the crews that set up and, uh, and build the courses and everything like that. And they said, hey, dude, you know, like, We've got some great course testers here, but uh, we'd love for you to be a part of like our team. And because um, I've got a bit of a rigging background and stunts and everything like that, 
um, I just sort of decided for season four, you know, by me taking a step away from the course and, um, you know, like I work in film and TV every day, you know, as a stuntman. So by me stepping away for a little bit allows someone who froths on the show, someone who's always wanted to compete on the show and never gotten the opportunity, instead of me jumping on for a third or fourth time, someone new gets to have a go and who knows, they might win the competition and I think that's awesome. So, so yes, yeah, so I've, I've opted to start working for the show, but in my opinion, it's better because I get to do every single course, I get to do every <laughs> single run. You know, it's just as fun. And if I want to be on TV, I go back to work and go on to do stunt stuff. <laughs> it's a win. Um, um, so, you, you've been a stunt fan uh, for how long? Um, so, I've been wanting to do it my whole life. I consider it my lifelong sort of occupation. But, um, but as a um, Australian stunt performer, you actually got to be graded, and um, it's kind of like similar to a, a you know a black belt grading, or I don't know, sort of like a certification, uh, but it's an yeah. internal sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I've I've been graded for about five years now on the Australian stunt registry. Um, I guess you could say, uh, yeah. So, are you able to tell us any of the things you were in? Uh, yeah, totally. Um, a lot of the my time has been mostly, should I say, mostly based in Australia. Um, I've done a couple of sort of bigger productions, um, including uh, what was it, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, oh, wow. Did time nice. on that. Um, didn't get the opportunity to get on Thor when they came out, so that was a bit of a bummer. Um, but I've worked on a lot of the local Australian sort of stuff, you know, Underbelly series, um, features on Chopper and that. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to. Uh, do a bit of work overseas, which unfortunately I can't expose what that one was because um, oh, they've had to put that to the side and um, start shooting again next year. But um, my most recent one was, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Preacher. It's a, it's a TV show um, produced by uh, Sony AMC. Um, I was the stunt double for Joseph Gilgan. Um, he plays a badass vampire jump around ripping people's throats out and that so yeah it was I've, I've seen that yeah <laughs> that's awesome man that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool when you're doubling some really cool characters jo joseph is uh he's a weapon of a dude like the funniest guy i've ever met um constantly wired out there character and um yeah mind-blowing individual <laughs> <laughs> But you so, must, uh, uh, sorry, go on, okay. um, you must, because of all this thing, you must have a strict uh, diet regimen and kind of workout must be very rigid for you, kind of, you have a set schedule, tell us all about that. Yeah, totally, um, well, uh, I'm not sure if this is airing within the whole coronavirus realm or if you guys have been talking about it too much at all, hopefully I'm not. I'll give you a pause if you need to edit anything there. No, 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 no. God, no. We're, no, we don't edit. It. It's, it's unfiltered. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about when you air these sort of things. But, um, but yeah, during this whole coronavirus thing, um, being that all films have been locked down and obviously a lot of other industries and work um, has been um, under wraps, um, basically I've had all the time in the world and no – obligations to be working so effectively I've actually uh, renovated my whole garage uh, I've got a full gym set up in the garage treadmill weights boxing bag all that sort of stuff okay. and I've actually spent about I don't know two and a half grand um, setting up a rock climbing wall so um, yeah I've got like a full bouldering space inside my garage which is basically a daily exercise for me at the moment um, getting on as often as possible resetting roots and uh and yeah, so spending a lot of time doing that, which is great. Um, so I've had the rock climbing training on, you know, dialed up quite high at the moment because that's a big part of my training regime. Um, keeps quite a slim body type and shape and stuff to be able to double actors, but still keep the uh, amount of strength and, and whatnot needed to be able to take falls and take hits and, um, and do what's required within Ninja Warrior and stunt performing. Um, so, yeah, training all the time at the moment. My diet, however, which you mentioned um, nutrition and that, I'll be completely honest. <laughs> also, <laughs> especially right now, it's just been, um, I've been, basically been living on uh, a diet of garlic bread and mashed potato because, um, 
not a bad diet. <laughs> hey, it, it tastes good, but it, it's not good for you. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not the healthiest of people when it comes to food. Um, but I think that I just owe that to me and my brain going, I need calories, which really I should probably put the correct cal- calories in. So anyone that's watching and listening, do the right stuff nutritionally. You'll benefit from it. Um, yeah, I'm just lucky enough that I can burn it all off through the activity. <laughs> yeah, so what's more important to you, the uh, the workouts or the diet? Oh, um, see, this is a really tough one. I've actually had a lot of people asking questions like that, you know, like how do I lose weight or how do I get stronger? And I think the way you've got to look at it in those sort of areas is what your goals are. For me, probably what's more important is the the exercise sort of stuff because – I don't just have to remain slim, you know. Um, if I was just having to remain slim, I would have a particular balanced diet um, that would be high content of food and and calor- uh, sorry, and um, and sugars and that like that to keep the energy in the day, but low calories to try and keep the weight down. Um, but if, say, for example, I'm doing a role where I have to bulk up, I hate it because like I don't I have no interest in food. I only eat it because it's fuel personally. Um, so all those foodies out there, I'm sorry, <laughs> you'll hate me for this. But- <laughs> But I hate bulking up because if I've got to try and consume, you know, three to 4,000 calories in a day, it, it tires me out. It is the worst thing ever, um, having to eat just heaps and heaps of food. And I'm a vegetarian as well, so bulk up as well. It's it's a lot of thinking and thought processing of what I can eat, what I can't eat. And yeah, it's a pain. Um, but, yeah, I, I value the, the training side of stuff more. But if someone else's goals are different, food is probably – usually the most important thing to be honest mm. and so, uh, uh, you said you were a vegetarian when did you transition to vegetarian or have you always been one uh no i've only been a vego for about uh two two years now um before that um over the years of traveling and and uh living overseas and abroad and you know being dirt cheap as a backpacker and that uh, I've been in and out of being a vegetarian because meat was more expensive typically than, you know, vegetables and that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but, yeah, now I've just figured it's, a, it's, it's an easier way for, for me to actually stay a bit healthier. It means that it's just one less thing that I gravitate towards. If I'm hungry, I don't just, you know, cook up some meat or grab out some chicken, uh, which by yeah. itself is probably not the greatest for you or steak or whatever. Instead, I'll go, oh, a bit more towards the – Vegetables will go towards this. Yes, I know garlic bread, but <laughs> so tasty. <laughs> yeah, that's not uh, bad. Um, so yeah, uh, if anyone's like trying out a vegetarian diet, what would you recommend to them? Because I, I know a few people personally who have been trying and failing. Yeah. Um, well, hey, a good good mentality to go towards is probably towards. Um, I, I like to think of don't take things out of your diet, instead switch it. You know, a lot of people think that being a vegetarian, you stop eating meat, and that's true. Um, But the way I think about it is instead of stopping eating meat, swap eating meat. So if you're normally going to have meat and veg, you know, as your typical um, diet or your typical, you know, go-to meal, instead of just having the veg, well, don't just take the meat out, swap it. So swap it for um, lentils or swap it for, you know, a, a, a meat burger, or, sorry, a, um, a vegetarian burger, um, veggie burgers, that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, as I said, lentils are great. Um, and try and find things like you can Google, the, Google's your friend, just find good meat replacement sort of stuff, um, soybeans, that sort of stuff, and find products that either have that or just use lentils and soybeans and stuff to create new dishes. So the amount of things that you can just take meat out and swap for something else, like carbonara, for example, you don't need it with bacon. You can put something else in, you know. So that's a lot of Italians who don't like that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's there's per- the other cool thing is this, um, especially in this um, last decade, I'd say the amount of um, meat replacement stuff that's come out is incredible. You know, if you wanted a spaghetti bolognese, you know, to all those Italians out there, and you wanted your mince, you needed your mince and your spaghetti bolognese. It's <laughs> which is, um, tastes almost identical to it, and it's just vegetarian instead. So look for those meat alternative products. They're awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Actually, it's been like a crazy amount of uh, 
replacements or even even in subway they do like the uh what was it they do like the the no meat meatball now yeah so and like that's, the, that's the other thing is it's becoming so much more accessible you know you don't just have to try and hunt like hey if it was easy i'd be vegan you know because i can tell you right yeah. now um I, I was often as possible like you know, I call myself a bit of a lazy vegan, you know, because I, I, I drink um, almond milk and try to minimize my amount of um, dairy consumption um, and eggs and all that sort of stuff. But the only thing that makes it hard in my brain with, with being a vegan is that um, you have to like read packets all the time. And it's so hard to know whether you're eating something that has animal products or not. So um, to the best of my ability, I always try and, you know, take dairy out of my, of my life as well. But, um, it's just, I'm, I'm lazy, man. Like when it comes to certain products, as long as it's not got meat in it, cool. You know, it's, it's easy to cut, <laughs> to swap meat out because you can tell if it's got meat in it or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do you find, uh, being vegetarian, like, or even seeing it with vegans, you know, like people focus a lot on when someone messes up compared to when they're doing well. As a vegan or vegetarian, you mean? Yeah, like say, uh, if you were a vegan, you had something that had like some mil- milk or eggs in it. Like people would call you out for it, but uh, oh. you could do it like strictly. People w- won't really care. Um. So do you mean like for performance things? Like as in, if say for example, like if you're doing an athletic thing and you're fat or you know you stuff up, someone goes, "Oh, it's because he doesn't eat meat." Do you mean like that or? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, so like that, I guess, I was, I was just trying to, sorry, I mustn't have heard your question properly. Um, but um, yeah, like I guess, you know, that's always been a, a common common trend. I think that it's even in the movies, there's a section where uh, some prison movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger gets punched and he's like, oh, you punch like a vegetarian, you know, <laughs> so it's, um, in that area. Um, but I think things are changing, you know, there's there's plenty of people, even on Ninja Warrior, that call themselves the vegan ninja um, or the vegetarian ninja or whatever, but I think those names are starting to be cut away because personally I think there's a lot of people that are vegan and vegetarian and with movies like The Game Changers, uh, which is also on Netflix, um, that's helped to try and make it more normal, you know, so it's not like, oh, you're a vegetarian, you're a vegan, you know, most likely if you're calling someone out as being a vegetarian or vegan in a group of people, there's at least two or three other people that's like, um... I'm vegetarian too. Like, why is that a thing? You know, uh, we've understood yeah. that. Yeah, there's some incredible, um, incredible, incredible athletes worldwide who are doing, you know, game-changing things that, uh, and they're just like, look, I just don't eat meat. You can still get your protein and everything else. Um, so, yeah, I suppose if that's if that's what you were sort of wondering, if like people call you out for that, yeah. Uh, then yeah, I suppose it's, it's happened a bit in the past, but. That doesn't really happen much anymore. Jokes are always made, you know, but <laughs> basically um, that's changing, I guess, as well. So uh, we know recently there was uh, fires in Australia. Uh, were you affected in any way by those? Um, no, not personally. That, well, we had a couple of areas um, close to our house uh, that we drove through smoke and you can see some red in the sky and stuff, but it wasn't too bad. Um there are a lot more areas, uh, like a lot further away from us, that were doing a lot worse. But um, there are a few stunt performers and coordinators that were on holidays at the time, and uh, they were locked down. Like they, they couldn't leave because the whole fires had surrounded their, you know, their town and that. So, um, but we were, we were pretty lucky. We, we were fairly sheltered from it, which was good. But now yeah, that's good. Uh, <laughs> we had a. Uh... Or uh, another guy who does the show with us, uh, Dara. He was in Australia uh, when it was going on, and uh, you know he he had to be. Well, Thomas didn't he have to get moved, or they he, got ready to move? They were in the red zone, and they were being in the process of ready to move, and then they were told they were all right and they could stay. Wow. He was he was living with his brother, who lives over in Perth at the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing with the fires is that um, a lot of people, first off, don't realise how big Australia is, you know. Um, we're, we we live sort of a bit north of Melbourne and um, a lot of the city areas are usually pretty good. Um, but, like, in the past I've had, you know, people from 
um, Sweden and different parts of Europe and that give me like calls on Facebook messages going, are you okay? You know, we heard this jelly is on fire. And it's just like, <laughs> thank you for the concern. Like we're completely fine. If you look at a little, like a map of Australia and you saw that, you know, Queensland, New South Wales were on fire. It's like, that. that's, that's like two countries away from us. If yeah. We really to the sides of Europe, you know? Um, so, so yeah, we, it, we were pretty safe, but but the uh, these fires that recently happened that did did cover a lot of ground, destroyed a lot of um, a lot of habitat, a lot of houses, and the worst thing with the follow on from that being coronavirus is a lot of people aren't working now. So um, insurance companies, you know, that are taking their sweet ass time paying out people that have had their houses destroyed and stuff like that, are, are now because they haven't had their payouts and then they're they're not working and. Um, and that, like a lot of people, are in some some pretty deep strife when it comes to um, those that were fire victims, because yeah, now they can't even work to earn money. So it's it's pretty pretty tragic, unfortunately. Yeah, the, the virus has done a lot of damage. I think to, to everyone in every country, like there's no one who's not badly affected by it. Yeah, totally. Like, and that's that's the thing is, you know, I don't want to do the whole like woe well, is us here in Australia because you know. Um, look at what's happened to, to Italy with the virus and, and America with, with what's going on there and um, like each Brazil different Brazil at the moment. So. That's, uh, yeah, in Brazil. Oh, shit. Yeah, so it's like, sorry if I'm not allowed to swear there. but No, no, you're, you're all right. right. Trust me. Um, but yeah, like every every region's got their own um, sort of problems. So it's, I don't know, it's pretty tragic, but hopefully we'll, we'll get through. Definitely, definitely with Australia, though, you've had, with the fires and everything, you've had a very rough year. For your economy and everything, yeah, you've been so been focused nice. on well, like <laughs> these massive things that nobody could have ever expected going into 2020. You know? It's yeah, and that, that's kind of that's kind of been the thing that's made it a little bit rough is that we had a big, you know, event happen right before this whole vir uh, virus sort of thing. So it's kind of like, I suppose that's why not much is happening now. <laughs> you know, um, like not much is unfolding because everyone's like, look, we've been through that. Now this happened. Let's all just just chill. Let's just actually stay in lockdown. Let's not try and cause any problem, problems. So, yeah, we're just kind of trying to let everything pass on by, hopefully, now. <laughs> and, with, uh, lockdown, and with lockdown in Australia now, how are, are you coming out of lockdown or what, are you, what stage are you at of it now? Um, each state is slightly different. Um, in Victoria, I think we've only just had... Uh, 11 cases sort of per per day or per couple of days we're the only ones sort of still having cases in victoria so our lockdown laws are still has a bit of stringency but um but it's not like you have to stay at home anymore it's definitely advised and that but um but you're allowed i think five people um over at your house um for you know for mental sanity sort of purposes not like yeah everyone let's host a party um but it's kind of like hey do your best and diligence to try and stay at home, minimize contact. And, and if you are contact, like, you know, being in contact with people outside of your house, you know, and you're visiting, let's say a friend or two, like try and keep it within just that group. You know what I mean? Like, uh, as opposed to visiting this friend and then that friend and that friend. And, you know, so, so it's kind of, it's easing up a little bit, but we're still, everyone's still wiping stuff down, using the hand spray and, um, yeah, there's even people that are employed by the government to, to go around and, like, wipe traffic, um, you know, the buttons for, for the lights and stuff. Just any oh, yeah. touch that's just around. So, <laughs> which, that's keeping people employed, which is good. Yeah. Uh, here we're entering stage two in three days. What, what does that mean again, Thomas? That means we can... Uh, we can go 20 kilometres outside our house. And we can meet in small groups of four inside or outside. And I think it means that people who are cocooning can stop now. I'm not sure. Or they yeah. already have to stop. I'm not sure anyway. Anyway, change. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good that you're coming out. I think um, a lot of Europe, by the sound of things, have had a bit more stringent with their, their lockdown laws and stuff. Um, Australia... <laughs> I just went over that. Australia is so big. I think that's the other thing is that, you know, us traveling 20 kilometers, like that might just take us to the next couple of suburbs, you know? <laughs> so, so that's the other yeah. thing where, where we've, we've still got fairly stringent lockdown laws, but there's a little bit of 
play with that to go, hey, look, you know, as long as you're just reasonable. Um, but yeah, so things are tra- changing and hopefully not not in for too long. I got to start working. <laughs> Need some money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you were obviously working the film and TV industry as well. Um, I, I do a bit of work on that as well, and yeah, I've been affected. Like there, there's there's no roles going around. I, in the last three months has been two, and they were eaten up straight away. Yeah, oh, there's absolutely nothing. It is ridiculous. I think the only um, we've only just recently had maybe one or two productions start back again. Uh, one of which being Neighbours. I don't know if you have seen or would have seen no, Neighbours. No, we, we've we've heard of Neighbours. Yeah, it's on it's on yeah. TV here. <laughs> A lot of Australian TV is actually pretty popular here. Oh, killer! Oh, that's cool. Well, yeah. So Neighbours is back shooting, um, but with you know social distancing. Apparently, there's like no touching. It's like Unless, you know, they have to, but, like, all shots are being done with, like, 1.5 metre distancing. Um, there's, like, a, a very unfortunate coronavirus safety person on set who I'm sure is hated by everyone because they're just <laughs> running around spraying stuff going, you move across from, you know, you can't stand that. No, I, don't touch that. You can't. Yeah. Oh, I might not be that person. I don't envy them at all. Um but yeah, so Neighbours is back shooting and I think there's now some um, negotiations going on, um, some discussions between, you know, heads of department and, uh, and producers and stuff to potentially look at starting, bringing back a couple of different productions with particular parameters and provisos and that. Um, I know TV commercials has kind of started back because they're smaller crews and so, yeah, just trying to keep that social distancing in that. So, yeah, hopefully... Gonna... hopefully yeah. Look at businesses like uh, the, like the USC and MMA. They're all starting back up now, and you think that you guys could probably get away with that Ninja Warrior, Beastmaster, because you could just wipe down the equipment after. Where these UFC fighters, they're definitely not following their social distance guidelines. Yeah, yeah. But the UFC have something special, which realistically, it's just two people. You know, so if you test both people, they're both clean. All right, cool. You can fight you. Off you go. You know, everyone else can social distance. You don't have to touch them. You know, the fighters have been working with the individual coaching team, so they're all kind of good with each other. So that sort of makes a bit of sense. And um, as long as they don't have audiences and that, um, we actually got lucky with Ninja Warrior because we actually were shooting right at the start of the whole coronavirus outbreak. Um, and I think in Victoria or maybe even all of Australia, Australian Ninja Warrior was the last TV movie, whatever production to be shut down. Like oh we went right to the last moment. Um, so yeah, we got, got pretty lucky that we managed to finish shooting that. So there will be a season four, which is good that will be released. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, so we just got in there. I think uh, season five is probably not pinned to start shooting until um, early next year, which is good. Um, yeah. yeah. Of course. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure they're shooting in Germany at the moment, actually, now that I think about it. Are they? Yeah. Ninja Warrior Germany <laughs> just back because they've been pretty good at locking down. So, yeah. Yeah, they've been doing all right compared to the rest of us. I wonder when they're starting back up now. I see. Um, so, I asked you beforehand if you're comfortable telling the story, but uh, could you tell us about the incident in the Congo? <laughs> yeah, no problems at all. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it was season season two, Ninja Warrior, I think they picked that story up. Um, yeah, it was uh, in, t- ooh, I'm trying to remember now, 2013 or 14, I can't remember exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, basically I, I've spent my whole sort of... Um, early, sorry, late teens uh, traveling and early 20s. Um, as soon as I finished high school, I decided oh, I want to get get overseas. So spent the first couple of years, you know, went to New Zealand, went to the States, traveled there for a little bit, uh, spent some time in Europe, did a season in Chamonix, um, the French Alps, and another summer in Barcelona. So I had a bit of fun traveling and ended up coming back home for a little bit, working retail and hating it, and then wanted to go traveling again and thought, what do I want to do? Like, I want to go somewhere a bit different. You know, I've, I've done, you know, I'm well, not done, but I've been to States, been to Europe. Um, and I figured, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to check out Africa. And um, at the time I was surfing heaps and, uh, and doing pretty well and um, approached a, uh, a surfing company um, about sponsorships because I had this idea that was like, hey, I want to try and surf along the whole uh, west coast of Africa. 
um, from South Africa all the way up to Morocco. Just a cool little idea. For, I hadn't really read much or researched much about the surfing there, but uh, good jumping on Google Earth and checking out the uh, the map. I was like, looks like there could be some pretty interesting surf spots. And um, yeah, approached this company. They're like, we agree with you. That sounds like a great idea, you know? So they gave me a little bit of cash and some gear, um, creatures of leisure and, um, and firewire surfboards. Uh, threw me some some bits and bobs, and um, basically it was on the proviso that that I go out there, travel, find some new locations, create a bit of a blog about the whole journey, and um, and uh, any good spots that I find, sort of relay it back to them, uh, so that they can do some little features on it on their website. And potentially the idea was to any new spots that I find, uh, they'd be flying out there. Pro- like I, I don't consider myself a professional surfer; I just do it for fun. Like I'm, I feel feel that I'm okay at it, but. Um, <laughs> Good enough to get a sponsorship, which is nice, but uh, but they would send out their pros, you know, the competitive guys, um, surf them and make some really cool cool videos of some different um, spots. And so that was the idea, that was the thought. And uh, so I picked up uh, all all my gear. Didn't didn't have much money. I got got a little bit, but not not enough to buy a car and travel around for a year. So um, my intention was a year, but I was going to try and rough it. So the intention was to kind of hitchhike. Um, do what I can to get by and sleep in a tent on the beach, basically. And um, yeah, after about seven months, I, <laughs> oh, about six months, I think it was, I got to halfway. So um, got to Kinshasa, which is in uh, in Congo. So I spent some time, you know, through South Africa and uh, Namibia. Um, but I actually couldn't get into Angola, so I had to go around through Zimbabwe and Zambia and that, and um, yeah, ended up getting to Congo and Kinshasa was the, the capital city. Um, so I spent a day or two there, and then um, inland from uh, Congo, uh, sorry, uh, towards the coast from from Congo uh, through Kinshasa, there's actually a tiny little coastline, and by tiny, that's tiny for Africa. I think it's maybe a hundred kilometers, um, which again in Africa is nothing. They've got this tiny little sort of co- coastline that we wanted to check out. Um, and uh, camped on the beach there for a little for a few days. Incredible surf, really good spot to be found. And um, yeah, and we tried to get into one particular spot, couldn't get in because there were some gates and stuff. And thought, oh, okay, we'll we'll, we'll give that a miss. And uh, one day we got picked up by immigration and uh, customs officials with uh, AK-47s, you know, pointed at our heads and they're yelling at us mm-hmm. and telling us what uh, what we're going to do. Um, a combination of broken English and uh, a bit of French. Um, I'm not proficient in French, but I do speak it and um, and can understand uh, quite a bit, a bunch. But as I said, not fluent. And uh, yeah, so I got thrown into a you know a, a van and taken back to Kinshasa. And after about a week and a half of just being held in some immigration facility, um, and this is like African immigration facility. Um, <laughs> And Congo, just as a bit of a, uh, a foreplay for everyone listening, <laughs> is um, is one of the the lowest um, socioeconomic countries I think listed uh, currently, or was at least a couple of years ago. Uh, they have the lowest development index, and so they're struggling. They're they're doing better now, but um, but yeah, that was the time they were going through some rough rough times, and uh, they'd just come out of you know civil wars and a lot of um, civil unrest and. Yeah, so we were held for about a week and a half and then transferred to what was called AN, ANR, which is Agence de Nationale de Renaissance, which is basically the National Intelligence Agency. Um, and throughout this whole time that we were held, we just thought maybe it was like a, a customs thing, like maybe we didn't have some forms done right or maybe they were after bribes or whatever. We didn't really know. They weren't telling us anything. They were just kind of asking us a lot of questions about how we traveled, you know, what we we're doing there, all that sort of stuff. It must have been um, terrifying. Yeah, it was pretty terrifying because, you know, when you're thrown in a cell with, with no description of what you've done or what your reasoning is, um, with a whole bunch of people, you've got no idea whether you're um, going to make it out of the day um, without getting beaten or tortured or whatever. Luckily, there was no really beatings or tortures, um, torturings that – you know, we um, were victims of, luckily, um, not at this stage anyway. And, um, yeah, so we were just held for a while and questioned and 
through talking to some of the other people in the jail cells. Um, and by, by talking, I mean, at first, for the first couple of days, we just kept to ourselves. We just stayed in our little corner. Um, to give a bit of an idea what these cells were like, by the way, it's like, it's not like a cell as in like a prison cell. It's more like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, imagine a, a stone room, like, like a rendered stone room that's maybe, I don't even know how to be, like maybe 15 metres by 15 metres and just crammed with a bunch of people and there's no, it's, yeah, it's not like a prison. It's hard to describe. It was just like a room, um, stone room that had no windows and walls and stuff. It had a door with little, you know, bars on it and it was really like weird and abstract because we're like, wait, this is immigration and customs and like how how is this you know legit you know and it's uh, it's yeah. it was really yeah. hard to try and believe them you know they're showing their badges and they've got the guns and the uniforms and stuff but it was like yeah it was really hard because we didn't know if it was a scam or what it was and we didn't want to pay a bribe because we're like well you know didn't that could get us into more trouble if they are officials and all that sort of stuff. So we kind of just waited it out and um, throughout these times we're getting one meal a day, um, one toilet break a day, uh, maybe getting a chance to wash and I'm talking like bucket sponge, you know, maybe once out of a week. Um, the rest of the time you're just sitting and waiting, you know, not able to do anything. Well, um, so yeah, so it was about a week and a half in this detention facility first, and then we we're transferred to the. Sorry, my story's a bit all over the place. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so after this week and a half in this immigration facility, we we're transferred to a, um, a the, the intelligence agency, and that that's when we started to get a bit more of an idea of what um, uh, what was going down. Um, in the end, we we're held for about a month. Um, so the rest of the time is in this immigration facility. Uh, sorry, in the, the intelligence agency facility. And, um, yeah, basically we got on well, the first time we were transferred across. Uh, they actually uh, sat us down and gave us proper grilling, um, told us um, that we shouldn't be here, all that sort of stuff. And we're like, we couldn't understand why, because in our heads we're just still these ignorant, you know, travellers with surfboards just kind of <laughs> shred the Nara dude, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> In their, in their heads, like, Congo takes up a lot of Central Africa. Like, they're not known for their coastline. They're like, you haven't come here to surf. That doesn't make sense to us, you know, um, for those that knew what surfing was. Um, but, yeah, they, they started interrogating us, and then they started showing these photos, and they said, what does this look, to you, look like to you? And that's when it kind of clicked to us because um, it looked like they were showing us a photo of a bomb. Um we played it off. We're like, oh, it looks like maybe an air compressor. And they're like, what about these wires? What do you think these wires are for? And we're like, oh, I don't know. It could be to power the air compressor, like to, to pump up a bike tire or something, you know. And they started, you know, they're yelling at us and they're just, you know, they're right up in our face. And in the end, they sort of started more accusing us. They're like, you put this here. You put that there. And that's where we're so thinking. So they thought you were terrorists. Yeah, so it basically in the end we, we started to figure out um, that we were in some, some trouble here. Um, we thought that, like we didn't know why they were showing us these photos and that, so we thought it was pretty, pretty much time to try and find a way to get help, you know. Um, at this stage we hadn't had a chance to contact anyone. That, that whole, we got one phone call sort of rule they have in the States um, very ignorantly. Mm -hmm. Thought that was the case, but turns out it's not. <laughs> when you're held, you're under their jurisdiction. They can kind of do whatever they want, you know. <laughs> so um, they're like, "We need a phone call. We need a phone call." No, that doesn't happen. So, um, yeah, basically, I I sort of took a punt and um, actually bribed one of the guards um, who spoke uh, good French but not any English at all, and um, kind of as I said, just took a punt on maybe that's the guy who can help us out. And I told, I gave him a hundred dollars that I had you know, hidden hundred American dollars hidden in the shoe. And I told him, Hey, look, I've got some more money in my bags. Um, if you can access them, I'll tell you where some more money is that you can grab. Um, if you can just let us use your phone, you know? Um, so he came back the day later, actually gave us a phone. Um, I didn't think I'd have enough time to, to make a phone call. Um, and I didn't want to get the country codes wrong. So I sent 
a text message to my mum's phone number, which is the only one I could remember <laughs> with all the country codes and stuff. <laughs> Send a text message saying, hey, I'm in prison. Um, this has happened. Rah, rah, rah. I'm at this facility. Contact consulate. This isn't a joke. I'm serious. Rah, rah, rah. And about five days later, we had um, uh, the South African ambassador and uh, the Canadian ambassador um, come to the facility and we ended up talking to them that, they told us sort of what we're being charged with and um, apparently we're being charged as being suspects for attempting to assassinate president oh. of, the, of the, the president of Democratic Republic of the Congo um, because uh, and the evidence that they had was that um, obviously we're traveling through uh, the country with no other documentation. We had no hotel bookings, no anything like that because we're camping. They thought we were potential mercenaries. Surfing was our cover. Um, they uh, also found that, well, they didn't find, but it turns out that one of our camping spots that we had by the coast was right next, like I'm talking in front of the um, the president's beach house, like his holiday house. So upon finding that news out, we were like, shit. Um, <laughs> and remember that, uh, that, that surfing spot that I said we were trying to access but we couldn't get to because it was all like caged off and everything? Turns that was turns out that was a uh, the like kind of the coastline area of their main uh, military base, um, like their big headquarters of their military operations in DRC. So, and we were just we didn't know that it's not on maps and stuff. You know, um, <laughs> saw a good point break that was out there on Google Maps, and we started, tried to get there. But yeah, after all this evidence, we're like, oh shit, you know, obviously it's not the case, but it looks like they've. They've got some pretty good reasons to, to be assuming um, control here. Um, my guess is that the reason why we were held for so long after that stage was because they probably realised that we weren't, in fact, the mercenaries or the terrorists that they thought that we were, and it had turned now into a whole, well, we've got these guys, we don't want to look like a bunch of idiots now with two national embassies coming to help these guys out. We're going to try and get some money out of them. That's my assumption um and they were just trying to sort of hustle for for some sort of like ransom from us um either from us or from these other government agencies and uh yeah the only thing that sort of got us out by luck in the end um was the canadian ambassador um brought up a little point which this is purely by chance like the biggest hail mary ever but um kinshasa the french-speaking um national uh, uh, capital of DRC, which is a French-speaking country, they were hosting um, the first ever Francophonie, which is kind of like the French Commonwealth um, yeah. in in uh, an African country. Um, and, yeah, that was starting, like, it ended up being a, a few days after we actually got out. Um, so they used, I think they used a bit of leverage. Hey, like, we've got this Australian in your custody, you've got this Australian in custody where on good terms with Australia, we're representing him in this sort of case. We've got our Prime Minister coming out in a few days on this big landmark, you know, 2020 style event for the French speaking sort of um, uh, Commonwealth. And, you know, I think they kind of put a bit of political pressure on him and, uh, and, and ended up getting us out. So if it wasn't for that, like, I, I, I would not doubt that I'd still be in there today or, or dead, you know, because the amount of people in those sort of parts of the country, of the um, the continent and the country uh, are just swept off the face of the earth is ridiculous. So, yeah, thank my lucky stars for that one. And um, irony is I didn't even realise until probably about a year after how bad things had gotten at the time when we were actually released um, into the, the custody of these um, South Africans and the, the Canadian sort of, ambassadors, um, my thought was just to keep going on my journey, keep going north and, uh, yeah, just shows how ignorant I was at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that honestly sounds terrifying. You, you couldn't make that up. No, you couldn't. <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of the reason why I have to tell the story. Sorry if there were no breaks there. Um, no, 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 that's perfect. Case, but <laughs> yeah, so a lot of time when I tell this story, I, I kind of have to do it all in one. Otherwise, you know, like it ends up, just being too ridiculous. If it told one whole story, it's like, okay, shit. Like he's really trying to nail those points. They all that'll happen. 
<laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, moving on since then, like you're obviously not going to try that trip again, are you? I don't know. It's you know, it's it's so hard to to actually answer that one because the the smart part of me says no. That that's a dumb idea to go back. Um, obviously, my my youthful spirit wanted to go back. You know, I was like. And, and I think also I'd spent six months, or seven months after that whole experience because I spent about a month in jail, seven months on that journey and the mission was to get to the north and I was kind of just under halfway. It was like, I'm already here. I want to keep going. After I got sent back home, I was like angry, you know, like I was innocent. Like I didn't do anything wrong. Um, obviously, I was also ignorant, um, but in my innocence, I was like, well, I should be allowed to keep going, you know, like it's yeah. not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. And um, since then, obviously now, since becoming a stuntman and having a proper career and income, I've got now a house and, you know, I've got a wife, two dogs. I've got more <laughs> things that i got to think about. I'm like, look, it's not wise to just go off and do something like that. But um, yeah. but I can tell you right now, if, if anyone ever wanted to make a movie about the situation, I'd use that as an excuse to head back. Um, if, that that if is I, a good uh, movie idea. <laughs> hey, hey, if anyone wants to make it, totally. <laughs> um, but like, it's it's any if it, there's anything that takes me back there, I would definitely go in a heartbeat because, despite the actual prison scenario and everything that happened, in my personal opinion, Africa is one of the most beautiful continents on the entire planet. Um, it is so incredible. The people there are so how do I put it? Like unfiltered is the best way. It's so unfiltered, you know, it, it's, it's incredible to just be there and be a part of everything, you know? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to go back, but I think, I think if I was to go back, I'd, I'd want to go to the start in the North, you know, go to Morocco and then try and find my way back down to finishing Congo. Um, just because Would you ever try it in the Mediterranean. Wow. Oh, totally, hundred percent. I think that yeah. that would be a pretty cool one. Start at like Gibraltar, Gibraltar and make your way over to Morocco and cross back over. It's funny you say that. Actually, um, uh, when I was living in Barcelona, this is like pre-Africa days. Uh, I was there for about six months, just living, uh, living well, mainly in Barcelona, but a bit through the rest of Spain. Um, yeah. I was bored one weekend and quite literally decided to hitchhike by myself down to uh, Gibraltar um, or what is it Tarifa I think is the most southern spot um, and yeah hitchhiked all the way down to Tarifa and um, on the way down I actually booked a flight from uh, Tangier in Morocco the north of Morocco back to Barcelona so that was my trip home and that was the last of my money because in my, in my head I thought oh, I want to get to Africa just to say I've been there and tick that box and then fly home um, and so I got to Gibraltar, uh, sorry, Tarifa, which is the southernmost spot, and um, I actually got, got mugged and had all my money stolen from me, and I had no way of getting across to Morocco to take the ferry. What is it with you when things like this happen? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> As I said, it's just ignorance. Like, you know when you're, you're young and you're, you're in your, what is it, 19s, 20s, and you think you're indestructible and, and yeah, the man. world owes you something? And you yeah, have the right. We're both eighteen, man. We're we're in the middle of that shit. <laughs> oh, you both. That, hey, perfect. There you go. <laughs> so heed my advice on this. You know, when you're eighteen, you're stupid, and you think you're invincible, and you think that the world owes you everything. So, but yeah, like, so when I got mugged, I I actually I couldn't afford uh, the the um the ferry across to to northern Morocco. Uh, so I feel really bad for this guy. Um, so I, I, I hired a car, or I, I busked on the street for a half a day, got my 10, 10 euros or something like that, um, hired a kayak and paddled a kayak from Tarifa, which is the southernmost spot in Spain, across to Morocco. Literally the dumbest thing I've ever done. It took me a whole day. Uh, I think it's only like 50 k's or something like that, which is long enough to paddle. Um, but yeah, it, I made it and when I got there, different set of issues because I didn't have entry stamps and all this other stuff. Uh, and I was held in prison there for a day and um, they <laughs> go it's cheaper for me to get back on the flight that I already had booked. 
than it was to hold me, entertain me, and everything else. And yeah, so that that was another got out lucky. But so just just to 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 flow on from what you were saying, yes, I have done that, and that was also stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there should be a movie made about you, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty I crazy. That's where, I think that's where it's also the other reason why I figure it's wise for me to kind of, even though I'd love to go back to Africa or, you know, I had ideas to travel to the Middle East. There's a, a company called Skater Stand, which um, they set up skating programs for kids um, as a way to teach them, you know, and, and it ties in with schooling and stuff like that. Really cool non-for-profit organization. I had an idea to go work with them for a little bit, but I just I feel like if I go to the Middle East, I'm just going to kind of go run into more troubles. So mm. that kind of has gone away. I think I'll just stay yeah. at home in Australia with my dogs. So there's a bit of tension around there at the moment, so maybe not now. <laughs> totally. So, yeah, all these different adventures. I think, I think I've done enough adventuring for the moment. I think I'll just stick to home life, stunt life, and ninja life. I think it's it, that's enough adrenaline for me right at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's still pretty crazy stuff. Yeah, definitely some difference there. But um, actually, if you don't mind me asking, I, I, what what ties your guys into this sort of stuff? Are you travelers yourself, or ninja warriors, or how, where was the interest there? If you don't mind me asking. Um, well, I, I'm an athlete and uh, I'm also an actor, so I I, I could kind of relate to some of the things that I've seen you do not not yeah. to the full extent like so I was, but I thought like oh this would be a really interesting guy to get in the podcast yeah cool and I watch American Ninja Warrior you know sometimes it's on the TV and I thought you know getting someone from the actual show to speak about their experiences and stuff like that man would be awesome you know like, the worst anyone can say is no so <laughs> so here you've got me uh, talking about Ninja Warrior at first and then I've taken a massive tangent by talking oh, about it I'm multiple arrest stories in multiple different <laughs> countries. <laughs> well, to be honest, man, we, we, our, that's our the stuff people yesterday. want to hear. That's brilliant. Our friend yesterday, we got into a conversation where he said he, you know, if he was the last man on earth, he'd like defile the queen's throne. So trust me, man, that's not the weirdest shit that's been said on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's been some weird stuff. Um, I have no opinion on the queen. I, I know we are under <laughs> the monarchy, but I know it's 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 not quite North Korea. But it's it's almost sacrilege to say anything bad about the Queen, so I won't even bother doing that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it was a joke, and he obviously didn't mean it. <laughs> yeah, he says that, but you know, every joke has a <laughs> meaning. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, your your brother was also on uh, Ninja Warrior, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was. Um, he's a bit of a weapon. He's got his own little potential story if you wanted to chat about that but um yeah he's he's a weapon he's um got a different build to me um i'm a bit slimmer like i like to think i've got a bit of muscle here but um but it's probably more just like you know lumps on bones really so uh, but no he's he's a real muscular dude he's um he's a little bit shorter than me but he's probably you know at least a few kilos heavier um so he's pretty staunch. Um, he was on season one and season two. We kind of wanted to do our Ninja Warrior experience together. It was, we both work fairly different hours and we, we live pretty separate from each other. So I think the cool thing about Ninja Warrior for us was it actually was quite literally an excuse to bring us together, uh, especially that mm -hmm. one season one and two was shot in Sydney. So, so we got flown out there, we got put up in hotels and we just hung out and watch movies together and hung, you know, just, and then, yeah, compete on this nice adult jungle gym together. So uh, that was cool. That, that was uh, really cool. You, you had like a, a marketing on your back saying like, at least I bet my brother, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. That, that played into it as well because in, in my personal opinion, my brother's my hero. He's, he's awesome. He, um, another little tangent, he, he, he battled cancer, um, came through obviously on the, on the positive um, when he was about 10, uh, he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and um, seeing him go through that as a kid, you kind of don't know what cancer is or whatever, but um, but but as you get a bit older, you realise what he went through, you know, like six to 12 months of like intensive chemo and treatment and that and see how resilient he was throughout that whole thing. Like, you know, he kind of became a bit of a hero figure for me, even though he's my younger brother. Don't tell him that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so seeing him go through that and then, you know, we've always 
sibling rivalry, you know, that sort of thing. We've we've always been pretty close, and uh, being able to go up against him on the uh, on on the, the the national or international stage, I should say, through Ninja Warrior was pretty special. And so that was kind of why I put it on my back is that that was my goal to beat my brother. If I beat my brother, it means that I was the coolest thing ever because I think he's the coolest thing ever. So, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no, that, that, that's that's insane that he went through that and came out the other side and he's like he's he's a he's a bulky guy he's huge. Yeah, uh, and then he did a uh, Ninja Warrior. Yeah, unfortunately he didn't he didn't fare too well. Um, I know he, I think actually he did make it through to the semis, um, but I think he fell on the second obstacle. Um, but season two he did a bit better. He he got closer towards finishing the semifinals, um, which was pretty good. I think that was his little you know little success there which was awesome um but yeah so just that was all that i wanted just as long as i can beat my brother then i can validate my own existence and um <laughs> so yeah I'd actually, um, go on. oh i was gonna say i'd love to see him actually now that i think about it in future seasons because i think a part of the reason why he didn't compete in season three um or season four was because i couldn't do it so he's like no oh, if you don't do it i'd don't want to do it, you know. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I'll try and force him to do next season, see how he goes without me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely love to see how he does, you know. <laughs> That's pretty cool, yeah. Getting um, lose so, <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Uh, I wonder. Sorry, distracted you. Well, uh, uh, something there, hold on. Oh, yeah, um, sports. So, at the moment, do you do any sports? Um, like obviously you do like a mix of stuff normally. Yeah, um, a mix of stuff. Uh, I, I I consider kind of my sport really at the moment to be rock climbing or bouldering, I guess. Um, rock climbing means you have to go outdoors, and right now can't do that. So, <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah, so climbing, bouldering has kind of been something I've been doing since I was maybe twelve. Uh, found a massive passion for it. Um, just love love the excuse to. I don't know, it's, there's something about it that when you're doing swimming, say, you, you're kind of doing the same motions, whereas for rock climbing, even when they think people just like think you're grabbing and pulling yourself up the wall, the more you get into it, the more you realise that your body position is so different and you're not just working your upper body, you're working your legs and doing all this sort of stuff. And Yeah, that's that's kind of my sport of choice right at the moment. Um, uh, but other than that, I think, yeah, just a lot of home gym stuff hitting the bag, a lot of Muay Thai and boxing. Um, it also plays into the stunt training because you've got to be pretty fight fight ready uh, in the stunt training world. And yeah, Would you consider yourself a martial artist? Oh, as soon as you consider yourself a martial artist, someone feels like they can fight you. So I generally say, nah, I just, I just play. Um, realistically, I can I can throw a good, good few punches in some sequences and stuff. Um, I consider myself a bad fighter because I'm a film fighter. And film fighter, I don't know if you can see the camera at all, but film fighters, we, we pr project, you know. You want to look yes. good for the camera. You want to make sure the camera can see the punch. But in the real fighting world, if someone can see the punch, they can dodge the punch and throw a right hook to your jaw. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so I feel like if I was in a real fight, I'd be like, yeah, come on, be like throwing punches it's really wide over their head and – big kicks that they can see from a mile away and they'll just floor me. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're not going to see you in the next uh, UFC, no? <laughs> no, I, I, I wouldn't assume so. They'll, um, they'll have me for dead. <laughs> we actually, when we were looking, trying to like, do a bit of research on you just so we knew what we were talking about, um, there's, there's another guy, shares the same name as you, but he was doing a, like a cage fight and we're like, he's a cage fighter as well? And then we realized it wasn't you. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, I'm, I'm not a cage fighter, um, not unless it's on TV, you know. <laughs> Put me in a cage and film it and it'll look good. But, but yeah, I, I, I've been in a few fights before, you know, like scrappy stuff as a teenager and that and um, more sparring, but I haven't, haven't sort of fought on a, um, you know, an amateur level or professional for that matter. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, th I think that's everything we can really ask you. Um, yeah, that was, that was brilliant. Um, <laughs> if people want to go follow you or they want to keep up with you, uh, where can they find you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite active now on Instagram with all this whole lockdown sort of stuff. And 
putting up a few of those sort of challenge videos and that. Um, so that's Crash Test Mozzie, kind of like, you know, Crash Test Dummy. Um, oh, yeah, for those who haven't picked up at all, um, even though Jaden Irving is my name, um, Mozzie is a nickname I've had for years. I think it's based on the whole ADHD brain of like being constantly distracted and not knowing what's going on, can't hold my attention. Um, but yeah, so Crash Test Mozzie is, is me and um, yeah, <laughs> that's where Mozzie came from. <laughs> well, thanks for coming um, on. You've been a great guest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, uh, I think the viewers are going to love that story about the Congo definitely <laughs> yeah sorry if I went on a different tangent but it's always a different story not many people have heard so hopefully it's a bit of fun but um, yeah thanks for having the chat guys it was uh, nice for you to listen thanks for coming on man <laughs> so uh, thanks for watching uh, make sure you like subscribe tell your grandma about it and uh, yeah take your handy <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy.